With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Hi, welcome back to Heard Tell. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Let's talk Alex Jones. The headline is splashy. This is a story we've been covering for quite some time. Let's turn the noise down on it just a little bit because social media, as usual, has a whole bunch of this wrong. Let's go to the Washington Post. Here's the facts of this. Now, this is a different case than the last case down in Texas that Alex Jones was found liable for his conduct involving the families of the Sandy Hook shooting victims. This one's in Connecticut. So let's go to the Washington Post for a minute. The headline glares. Alex Jones ordered to pay nearly $1 billion to Sandy Hook families. First of all, before we even get into this piece, let's just cover something real quick. The families are not going to get a billion dollars. They're not going to get a fraction of that. I doubt they get very much, if any, financial compensation at all out of Jones. They should. Uh, he's been moving around millions and millions of dollars and trying to hedge it and hide it from authorities. That's not my opinion. That's come out in the court documents. That's happening. He's trying to shield his assets. He's already had his companies and the parent companies of his InfoWars program declare bankruptcy. He's trying to keep the money out of these hands because this would obviously ruin him. Frankly, he deserves to be ruined for what he did here. But let's go to this, and then we're going to talk about the social media reaction for just a second. Washington Post, a Connecticut jury ordered InfoWars founder Alex Jones to pay $965 million in damages to the family of eight victims of the Sandy Hook shooting for suffering caused by years of lies at the massacre was a hoax. Wednesday's verdict marks the largest award to date in a multi-pronged legal battle by the families to hold Jones responsible for circulating falsehoods about the 2012 mass shootings in which 20 children and six educators were killed in an elementary school in Newtown, Connecticut. Within hours of the shooting, Jones was telling his audience it was staged as a pretext for confiscating guns. Within days, he began to suggest the grieving parents were actors. In the years that followed, he repeatedly said the massacre was fake. The families testified during the trial that the lies spread by Jones led to harassment and threats by conspiracy theorists who have accused them of faking their own children's deaths. They described feelings unsafe in their homes and hypervigilance in public. Some of the families moved away. The largest single award of $120 million went to Robbie Parker, whose six-year-old daughter Emily was killed in the shooting. Jones spent years mocking Parker particularly as an actor. Plaintiffs also include an FBI agent who responded to the shooting. He was awarded $90 million in damages. After a unanimous verdict was announced, the family members gathered outside the courthouse and gave statements. The size of the damage awards is a sign that the jurors found Jones' conduct particularly reprehensible. Here's the important part, though. The damages announced on Wednesday are meant to compensate the victims for reputational damage and emotional distress. The judge will decide on the punitive damages next month. The Connecticut case is one of three defamation suits filed against Jones by relatives of the victims who have said they hope to prevent other families from having to go through this. In August, a jury in a different case in Texas ordered a $50 million settlement, but that payment will be fall smaller because of the limits of such awards in the state. It'll be part down to, I think, 750000 something like that. Jones refused. Now, this is the most important part of this whole story, because remember, this is a legal action. Jones refused to share crucial evidence, including financial records and data on traffic to his website, with the plaintiffs in the Connecticut case in violation of his legal obligations. Judge Barbara Bellis entered a default judgment. In other words, since Jones completely refused to play along and participate in this process and follow the law, she basically stopped the trial and found him uh, culpable and found for the plaintiffs in this lawsuit. Remember, this is a civil lawsuit, not a criminal lawsuit, so it's not a guilt thing. But she found, because he would not conduct himself properly, that he automatically lost the case. That's how bad his behavior was here. Judge Barbara Bellis entered a default judgment against him, holding him liable for defamation. The jury's only task, Bellis said, is to deliberate and determine the extent of the harm. The state of Jones's finances is murky. In a Texas trial, Bernard Pettigill, the forensic economist hired by the plaintiffs, estimated his companies have a net worth of up to $270 million. And also revealed that Jones withdrew $620 million in 2021 Earlier this year, InfoWars and its parent company, Free Speech System, filed for bankruptcy protection. 
He was also very belligerent on the stand and largely unrepentant when Christopher Mattei, the lawyer for the family, told Jones to show more respect for the relatives in the courtroom. Jones lashed out. It's a quote from Jones, among many despicable things he said. Is this a struggle session? Are we in China? I've already said I'm sorry a hundred times and I'm done saying I'm sorry. Now, social media being social media, a lot of people are jumping on this and there's been a coordinated effort. And when I say coordinated, I mean coordinated, as in the biblical sense of coordinated. Because there are people, if you go and look at their tweets and their Facebook posts, they're all saying basically the same things. Now, you can assume that they all just think the same things, or you can assume they all have some group think, or you can assume that the memo went out, and this is how we're going to make our clicks and fundraising and keep the money train going based off this thing. The line is, is that his free speech rights are being trampled, and the people that are being a little more careful are going, oh, Jones is awful, but this is clearly people crushing his free speech rights and blah, 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 blah. Hold on. Anybody on your social media who is defending Alex Jones and saying that this is all part of, my favorite one was the regime crushed him. The regime didn't have anything to do with this. This was a civil uh, lawsuit. So this doesn't have anything to do with the sitting president or the government or the Democratic Party or anybody else. It's always the anonymous they. It's always the social media companies. Do yourself a favor. If anybody on your social media is taking up for Jones and saying that this is part of a conspiracy and that he's being silenced, you need to unfollow, unfriend, or otherwise get that person off your timelines. They're not bringing anything good to your life. You need to cut them out, prune that tree. You're not going to get any good fruit off it. This was a long, drawn-off legal process. There's a reason why libel and slander trials are some of the hardest trials to win in the American court system. It's really hard to prove it. And I want to reiterate what we just read. This was a default judgment because Alex Jones refused to participate, broke the law, refused to reveal things because he has many, many things to hide, and that's why he lost this case. He was absolutely culpable for what he did, and these families deserved compensation. Now, once again, they're not going to see $1 billion. That's not going to happen. I doubt they see a very significant amount of money at all. It'll probably be in the tens of thousands of dollars if they get anything at all after their court fees and lawyer fees and everything else. That's the sad truth of how these things happen. But maybe, just maybe, this will start serving as a deterrent to the absolute worst among us in society like the Alex Joneses, who has built an empire of money selling crap stimulants and merchandise on the back of conspiracy theories. I do hope this bankrupts him. I do hope it makes him a business model that is untouchable and that folks won't flock to it, but they will. They'll be the corners and the dredges of the society who will flock to him even more because of this, because now he's being persecuted. No, he's not being persecuted. Alex Jones chose this path. Nobody screwed Alex Jones. Alex Jones screwed Alex Jones. And the legal system, slow as it is, limited as it is, worked here. Anybody that wants to do anything other than defend the victims here and say that Alex Jones is actually the victim here, you might want to prune that person from your life, at least your social media, because that person isn't giving you anything productive out of something that is one of the more clear-cut cases of whether something was right or wrong. If you're doing anything other than saying Alex Jones was wrong here, you're excusing, you're justifying. And you've got a problem with you. More Hertel right after this. Uh, Welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, he's back. We always enjoy talking to our friend Travis Nix. He is in D.C. He's at Georgetown because he's one of them real smart fellers. We love talking to him. Going to talk a little taxes today. Travis, how are you, sir? Good to see you again. I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, glad to have you back and not for you to tell me I'm wrong this time, unlike last time. But we won't talk about that, nor hold it against you. Uh, You're in the Wall Street Journal writing. That's a good get, by the way. Congratulations. 
you're talking taxes and the law. I want to start with some basic background because taxes is another one of those things. Look, taxes is most people's main engagement with their government. They pay their taxes, right? This is so foundational to our government that this is, it's not an overblown statement. This is how we wound up with a constitution because the article of confederation, they couldn't get the tax stuff right. So they sat down. Our whole system of government is based on the government's ability to tax and who taxes and why they tax. I think we need to start there before we get to the legal stuff and what's going on now, because I just don't think there's a good fundamental literacy on what taxes are, are not, should be, and have become when they shouldn't have been. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, yeah, you're completely right. Taxes are definitely foundational to our constitutional background. You can make the argument that our whole constitution is based on trying to eliminate discriminatory taxes, discriminatory tariffs, stuff like that. So when we think about taxes, ideally, we just collect as much taxes as we need to fund the government, to fund very specific priorities that the government has. And we want to raise the taxes in the most economically efficient way possible. So you want to raise the tax revenue in the way that does the least amount of damage to the economy, because all taxes take money out of people's pockets, obviously. Uh, to fund government projects, which creates a economic loss and inefficiency. So the way that you make the tax code more efficient is you raise the revenue in a way that doesn't distort people's choices. So it's trying to eliminate discriminatory taxes, basically. Yeah. And we understand that that's not a utopian thing. You know, the founding fathers did not ride unicorns in and sign all this in magic ink that, you know, binds people forever. These are human beings. We understand that there's government bureaucracy. We understand there's government bloat. That's why we have separation of powers, judicial review, and the legislative branch was given the power that purse. The entire idea of this government, and I'm just making this into a small ball so we can talk about it. It's much more complicated than this. The whole idea was taxing and funding of our government was supposed to have layers of oversight. It was supposed to have accountability. And it was supposed to have multiple people's hands in who does it, why they do it, and how it gets allocated, right? Yeah, exactly. 100%. Congress is supposed to set the tax rate based on what they want to fund. The president obviously has veto power. He can propose his own budget to try and get Congress to pass it. And there is judicial protections all throughout the Constitution for taxes. For example, you can't impose a direct tax like a property tax. We can't have a national property tax without it being apportioned based on state population, which is impossible. So the framers definitely tried to make it as difficult as possible for people to tax um, until the 17th or 16th Amendment made it a lot easier with the income tax. Yeah, Travis, next joining us. Okay, that's the ideal. As we sit right now in the year of our Lord 2022, where we can't even get a budget in its traditional form passed, where we don't have a Congress that's working in good order. And I don't mean good order is in good. I mean, good order is in the way they're supposed to function. Um, how far off of that are we right now? Because it seems like we're clear off the map on it where we're doing, you know, we're just doing one right now. Continuing resolution, just to keep the government going. We always have funding crisis every October. How far off the mark are we from what the ideal was? We're so far off what the ideal was. Because like you said, with all these continuing budget resolutions where there's really no oversight on the funding, there's really a disconnect between taxes and spending. Because we have so much of a deficit, we're so much in debt, Our ta a lot of our tax money, um, it doesn't cover the spending, obviously. That's why we have to borrow so much in debt. So it's a complete disconnect from what we should be. And we have, obviously, economically harmful taxes riddled throughout the tax code. So much amb 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 ambiguous provisions that if you don't comply with, the IRS can go and slap, slap a very fat penalty on you that's just punitive that doesn't help them recover the revenue at all. Yeah, Travis, next joining us. Let's talk about the IRS for a second because it's been all over the news. We know about the 86,000 new IRS agents. I think a more helpful way to do this is to kind of talk about the IRS, the way we've had to start talking about the military, the way we've had to talk about education in the last few years. Anything that has a government bureaucracy attached to it really has two parts. It has the actual function that you have to have. And the IRS has a very important function. They need to collect the taxes. 
They need to enforce the taxes. They need to distribute the money. They need to distribute things like refunds back. They have an important function. Then on top of that, you have all these layers of bureaucracy that does all the bad stuff you're talking about. How do we have that conversation like the military? You know, the military is very important, but we also say, oh, this is for the military. And it goes to some, you know, office out in Arlington somewhere. Same thing with education, same thing with everything. How do we get into that conversation about the IRS of like, yes, there's needed funding to upgrade how they process taxes. It's a mess. But we also don't want this enforcement arm getting out of control. And the bureaucracy doesn't need to continue to grow that caused the problem with the collection of taxes in the first place. Yeah, I think it really starts with more IRS oversight. So a lot of people don't know this, but the IRS actually has an oversight board that the president is supposed to appoint. This oversight board has basically been empty since 2010. So it essentially doesn't exist anymore. And what they're supposed to do is file a yearly report <clears throat> about ways the IRS can improve itself, improve its customer service, making sure they're not doing very punitive um, practices that <clears throat> have no other purpose other than to harm taxpayers. So I think IRS oversight really starts with trying to fill this IRS board and then hopefully Congress will start listening to them. Congress should be having more hearings and stuff like that to figure out where all this new money is going to and try and limit it to less for enforcement and more for improving customer service. So when someone calls the IRS, when a normal taxpayer calls the IRS to figure out how they're supposed to do their taxes, someone will actually pick up the phone, which doesn't happen anymore. Right. Or, you know, they could actually try to do messaging and things like everybody else in the world's doing these. days travis nix joining us Let, let's just go there with it we understand you need to enforce taxes we know because the irs themselves admitted it a few years ago they don't go after the the big people because they don't have they say it's not funding the really rich of course have the ability to fight it and drag it out court tax cases are incredibly complicated you can speak to that as somebody that studies the law how do we make sure that it's not just them going after the low hanging fruit? Not that people that, you know, don't make a lot of money, don't cheat on their taxes. They do, but there needs to be a proportionality. You know, do they really need to be leveling 140% fines against people's homes over a couple thousand dollars of taxes? Is there things they can do financial penalty wise? Can they have some kind of a gradient system instead of just, you know, going straight to garnishing people's wages? There seems like there's a whole spectrum of options in here. And yet when it comes to enforcement, they just want to go straight to the sledgehammer all the time. Yeah, I think the problem is so everyone has like a taxpayer bill of rights that's supposed to offer all of these protections. It's something when Congress reformed the IRS into, in the 1990s that they did. And this basically your bill of rights, it has all these rights of how the like an audit is supposed to go. And it's supposed to offer all these protections for taxpayers. It's unenforceable. A court has never enforced it. So I think that if we could get something like that, that could actually make it enforceable. And we can have, it can be judicially enforced, or we can have just the court start interpreting the Constitution again, because we have an Eighth Amendment that's supposed to protect people from excessive fines. And the tax code's riddled with 50% fines. It can even be higher than that in certain cases that if we can start striking those down those penalties down as excessive fines that serve no purpose other than to punish taxpayers uh the eighth amendment is not one of the sexy ones it's not the first amendment it's not the second amendment we don't have people walking around with you know eighth amendment tattoos like they do with the second one right uh we don't have whole yeah. organizations built around the first amendment like we do with that which we should because those are important People don't know that Eighth Amendment. So just real quick, making sure we got everybody on the same song sheet here, just walk through what the Eighth Amendment does. More importantly, what it doesn't do, because when we're talking constitutional law, these things were written a little bit open-ended on purpose. So walk us through the Eighth Amendment. 
Yeah, so everyone knows the Eighth Amendment because it prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. That's just one of the clauses in it. There's about five clauses in it. And one of the clauses that I think can be the most useful for taxes is there's a prohibition against excessive government fines. Um, this is a right that dates all the way back to the Magna Carta. It's in the English Bill of Rights, and then we adopted it in our own constitution. It's supposed to protect people, or protect American citizens against excessive um, fines in connection to a crime. So criminal fines, which do exist, as well as civil fines in a purely civil lawsuit of the government coming after people for unpaid taxes, stuff like that, and then slapping them with a 100% fine. Yeah. And here's this is where this legally and your piece in the Wall Street Journal, you're talking about the courts intervening. Fines and taxes are legal definitions. Those are legal terms. This is probably mostly known for folks from the Roberts decision and the ACA ruling where it's like, was well, it a fine or is it a tax? And we will hash that out some other time. It's a fine line. It's a moving line. Walk folks through that, though, because to the average American, whether it's a fine or a tax, it's the exact same thing. It's money coming out of your pocket. So they don't see the difference. We also see this. This is a big problem in the criminal justice system too. fines, punitive fines for punishment, tax code wise, judicial wise. Walk us through that, the differences and why it's so important, whether it's a fine or a tax, because legally there's a lot of restraints on one and the other one's pretty ambiguous in it. Yeah. So. A tax is obviously that's something that Congress passed for the purpose of raising revenue. There's no punishment purpose. It's Congress saying, this is what we need to raise to fund the government. A fine is something on top of that. So it's something that when the IRS comes to you and says that you owe $100, and then they're going to say, no, you don't really owe $100. We're also going to impose a $50 on top of that, $50 on top of that to punish you for not doing your taxes right or whatever, or to say, we need these fines in order to deter other taxpayers from making the same mistake you did. So it has a, a, a criminal justice aspect to it in terms of people, they, they, it's a, it has a deterrence purpose. All right, Travis, next joining us. I've seen this personally with people that got into trouble with the IRS. They go after your homes. They go after your wages. I know one case where they actually went after the house and property of a guy's mother-in-law because they didn't think they could get enough equity out of his stuff. People do not understand the wide-ranging powers the IRS has to investigate, to take, to levy these liens. Just, I, it's It's expansive, but try to explain to folks you know, they talk about a cop coming to your house and you just say, well, I got a warrant and they got to kind of hold them up. The IRS has some power even beyond things like that. They're they're well nigh unpregnantable to the average American when the IRS shows up at your door. And it's really scary stuff for folks that probably need to know how powerful they really are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it starts it starts at the beginning. It starts with the audit. They can basically audit your tax re return for any reason. They don't have to have any suspicion that you're wrong, they can just look at it to confirm that you are right. And so once that happens, once they start looking at your return, that's an audit and it goes from there. And it could take years, it could take months, it just depends on the amount of receipts that you have because taxpayers are guilty until proven innocent. So when the IRS looks at your tax return, taxpayers have to prove through documentation that their math and their deductions and everything's right. The IRS um, does not have to prove that they are right in court. And then once the IRS um, gets you for something, they have very, there is an IRS manual that they have to follow. And there is a judicial process on putting liens against people's homes and stuff. But they have very vast collection power uh, to seize your assets, seize your homes, garnish wages. Um, to be able to collect your unpaid tax. Yeah, and you're talking the judicial side of this, but really most of the problems when it comes to the IRS, and we're bashing them a little bit here because they deserve it, but to be fair to the IRS, they're supposed to be governed by Congress. They're supposed to have pretty strict, you know, boundaries put on them by Congress. 
And we have a Congress that's not really been interested in putting boundaries and guardrails on the government, let alone taking care of their financing, let alone taking care of their funding to things that they really need, like updating how you do your taxes and fixing all those piles of paper sitting around and not doing things like, you know, funding the bureaucracy that makes the problem worse. How much, give me the ratio, how much of this is a judicial problem? How much of this is a congressional problem? Well, it's all a congressional problem because Congress is the one who wrote these penalties in the law. So like one of the pieces that are in my article that I wrote, there's a penalty for if you don't report a foreign bank account to the IRS, the IRS can either take $100,000 or 50% of what's ever in that bank account. That's a Congress. That's a congressional problem because Congress is the one that gave the IRS the discretion to make that decision when it should probably just be, you know, a flat $100,000 versus if you have a $5 million bank dollar bank account, they can take two and a half million, which is what the IRS did in one of these cases pending for the Supreme Court. But it's also a judicial problem because when Congress makes the mistake of writing in a very excessive and punitive penalty, the court are not stepping in to say that they can't do this, that this fine, this penalty is so outrageous that it's unconstitutional. The courts aren't willing to step that in. So it's a Congress it's a congressional problem because Congress created the problem, but the judiciary is not providing a remedy to taxpayers who are being hit with these fines. So talking remedies, what do we do about it? Because people are looking at the IRS and go, man, they're they're well nigh, you know, all powerful as far as the American citizens concerned. There's nothing I can do about that. Congress is, you know, a mess. They're not going to do anything about it. You know, the Supreme Court, who knows where that's going to go. I can see the frustration of American citizens just throwing their hands up and going, what? But we also don't want them to be, you know, some of the fear mongering that's going on, like, you know, 87,000 IRS agents. No, not all 87,000 of them are on a SWAT team is going to kick in your door. That's ridiculous too. But a legitimate concern, what do we do about this? I think it's it starts with Congress, obviously, because people have the most control over Congress, making sure that congressmen are aware of these problems. Because I think, I don't even think, if you were to ask every the average congressman what's in the tax code, what types of penalties do you impose on taxpayers? They would have no idea. So I think it's an educational thing that we need to educate. As scary as this sounds, we need to educate congressmen on the consequences of their decisions and bring some of these stories that I talk about in my piece to light on what the IRS can actually do to someone. Yeah, Travis Nix. Um just to get personal for a second, I, I I had a very close friend who went through a thing with the IRS. I've seen other people do it. I've read some real horror stories on what they can do to your lives. I just touched on it, but I want to hit it again. The enforcement angle of this went viral because that just scares the bejeebus out of people. It just scares folks. And it should because they have a lot of power. Our government's supposed to work for us. So when you have something that's going to have an innate thing that everybody hates, like collecting taxes, we talked about educating, you know, the people in Congress. We also need to educate the American people a little bit about, hey, yes, they need to collect taxes because before you can really complain about it, you need to understand what it should look like when it's fully functional. Right. Yeah. So how do we educate them? Like, look, this is why we're complaining. Instead of just fear mongering about it, go, look, this is why we're complaining about the enforcement part because the part of them actually collecting the taxes and you can pull up on Google, the pictures of just stacks of paper in the cafeterias of the IRS because they can't put it anywhere. That kind of stuff. How do we educate the American people? How do we educate us so that we're better for this discourse and this discussion as well? Yeah. I think the IRS has some culpability on this just because they don't, the IRS likes to play everything close to the vest. They don't like to talk about, how bad their problems are because they think that if 
they reveal all this to the American public that then more people will cheat on their taxes. So they don't want to talk about how they have 30 year old computer systems and stuff like that. I think it's hard. So it's very hard to educate the average American on the IRS's customer, well, I'll call customer service problems when the IRS itself doesn't really like to talk about it in public forum. So I think the IRS also needs to get more comfortable talking about its procedures and trying to show to the American people that they are not the big bad wolf. They are that they are not going to come kick down your door that a lot of them they're just good people trying to do their jobs and then they're just their hand tied by congress that this is what congress wrote for them so i think the irs needs to you never see a public press conference by the head of the irs you never see it from the irs commissioner i think it should be a much more visible position in american law and in American politics so that people actually have a figurehead and they just don't see the evil in the IRS that they're actually trying to do their job, stuff like that. I think that would go a long way in improving the IRS's image with a lot of Americans. Travis, next joining us. I think this is an important point because I think this is one of the lessons of COVID where government officials did a really bad job of just messaging and basic communicating. We learned, we just talked to our friend, Michael, Se Dr. Michael Siegel about this. We learned that scientists don't know how to talk to normal average American people. We learned that the government scientists are even worse at it. We learned that bureaucrats don't speak media. We learned that the media don't know how to ask questions of the bureaucrats and the scientists. I think this same problem applies to the IRS. I think they're still under the mentality. The FBI has got the same problem, by the way. They still think they're this institution that's above it all. And you're not anymore. And you have to communicate to the people because the people have a whole lot of power to talk back, to promote their own stories. To They can record on a phone when your agent comes to their house now. That's probably going to start happening. I think there's an institutional thing here where these institutions are used to just being a part of the bureaucracy and technology has changed it. And the people have some power now like, no, this bureaucracy is still ours and you need to answer to us they should probably get ahead of it and start communicating to the people directly a lot better. And I know that's going to be hard and it's going to be messy. That's a whole of government problem. I think that's really expanded on what you just said. Yeah, exactly. As with this new IRS funding package that the Democrats passed, not one time have you seen in the mainstream media, uh, the head of the IRS, the IRS commissioner, actually, we don't even have an IRS commissioner right now. So that's, that's a, that's a whole different story. Biden is probably going to nominate somebody, but there's not even the head of the IRS right now. Biden's worried about they can't get Senate confirmation. So he just hasn't nominated anybody to take over from the Trump administration. So like, but we don't even have a deputy secretary. Nobody has actually gone out and communicated to the public effectively on how they are going to use this money and what it's going to be used for. And I think that would go a long way in um, restoring, trying to restore relations with the American people. Yeah, and government has to have a relationship with the people. That's where a cause of a lot of these problems are. It's a lot bigger topic for another day, but that, that's the core to a lot of our cultural and political problems right there is the government and the people got to work together both ways. And people aren't great about it either. Um, but this really, you know, when, when you have a, a organization that can wreck your life. It's really important that you're at least communicating correctly. Travis Nix, this is great stuff. This piece has a lot of in-depth stuff to it. Make sure you read the whole thing. We'll link to it. Read it for yourself. It's in the Wall Street Journal uh, because he's an up-and-coming guy and we're lucky to have him. Uh, till we get you back on Hertel again, my friend, let folks know where they can keep up with you and what you've got going on. Uh, easiest ways on Twitter at TNix, N-I-X-113. Thank you so much for having me again. Always happy to be on. Yep, and we don't even hold it against him that he's a Villanova Georgetown Cubs fan. I think you may be the only person I know that's that trifecta, but that's pretty amazing. Thank you. <laughs> All right, buddy. We'll talk again soon. Talk soon. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you sir.
Ah, welcome back to Her Tale. Okay, she is back. You can see her. She's right there if you're watching on YouTube. For you folks on the podcast, just have to take my word for it until she starts talking. She's actually in Alaska because she works for the Alaska Policy Forum as she talks to us today. Uh, she's also our West Virginia correspondent. Boy, you've got it covered side to side in the lower 48 and Alaska both, don't you? Quinn Townsend's back. How are you? Good. How are you? You're all over the place. How do you keep track? Like, um, Alaska and West Virginia are very similar in their energy policies, so that helps. Um, <laughs> Just not the time <laughs> difference and the amount of daylight. Yes, yeah. Which is it right now? Is it the too much daylight or too much darkness? Which time of the year are we in in Alaska right now? Um, it's not too bad right now. It's about how it is um, out east, although it's still it's seven o'clock in the morning here and it's still very dark. So. <laughs> love it if you ever get a chance to go to alaska or west virginia both of those places need to be on your bucket list especially right now in the fall in west virginia it's just gorgeous uh let's talk west virginia um everybody's favorite u.s senator joe manchin everybody's hero to hate um this policy of his where he's trying to get this um reform done here's what happened let me just nutshell this before we get into the actual policy is the policy never got discussed because it was Build Back Mansion and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. And he got that through with the understanding he would get consideration on this bill. And then when he didn't, the, the news media and the commentary, it just went, ha, 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 Mansion didn't get what he wanted. And they moved on. But underneath that, there was actually a policy that whether you agreed with it or not, I think it's worth at least discussing. And that really got lost in all the national narrative, didn't it? Yeah, it really did. Yeah, so just widely, broadly speaking, um, permitting reform would require faster approval of permits, so energy production permits typically. Um, that's not just fossil fuel, although that's what everyone throws around, but that also um, includes wind, solar, geothermal, hydropower, all of the energy production projects have to go through rigorous environmental studies and permitting approval, and they can take many, many years and millions of dollars, depending how large the project is. And so permitting reform would simply require, there would still be environmental processes and approval, but there would be a requirement to make it faster. Um, because when it takes five, six, seven years to get something approved when we need it next year, that's really not helpful for Americans who are struggling with their energy bills. Yeah, uh, Quinn Townsend joining us. This isn't just about building stuff, though, too. This applies to all federal regulation. You used a real life catastrophe example in your piece. This is in Real Clear Energy. We'll link to it like always. Read the whole thing. She's got a ton of links in here that you need to click through, read all them, too. The Caldor fire out in California in 2021, the investigative report on that found, quote unquote, regulatory delays. And the U.S. Forest Service made some mistakes on top of it as part of the blame for this. So the U.S. Forest Service, of course, is a federal institution. It's just like anything else in the government. It affects things like this as well, where they're trying to do things like land clearing, proper forest management. That all can, that involves construction. That often involves third-party contractors, things like this. So it's not mm -hmm. just pipelines and energy. That's a real-world thing that really affects people's lives, and it's another example of something that needs to be sped up, especially before you have a crisis, because you got to prevent forest fires. Not a lot you can do once they start. Right. Yeah. Why did you go to that example, other than just it's so glaring of like the government screwed this up and you know acres and acres of land burned up? I think for everyone out West, particularly, um, it's just a very stark example. It was a tragedy and all of a lot of these fires, um, very large wildfire fires can be, if not prevented, at least they could have been much smaller if um, the Forest Service and other um, agencies involved in land management were able to do what they needed to do um, to clean up forests, uh, to prevent wildfires being worse, which everyone who lives out west and has experienced the smoke or, God forbid, even had to leave their homes, that's, that's people's lives and livelihoods that the wildfires affect.
Yeah, um, Quinn Townsend joining us. You you hit on something in the beginning of that, though, out west. Part of the problem of federal regulation is we have a big, diverse country. You know, yeah. wildfires in California are different than wildfires in the Smoky Mountains or the Appalachians. Uh, there's water issues out west in California, the southern deserts, Nevada. There's a big water problem. The northeast doesn't have a water problem, but they've got other regulatory. So, you know, the north, south, the southern border. We have a diverse country that's going to require some diverse regulatory reform on things like this. Part of speeding it up, too, is when you have trying to do a one size fits all for something this big, the bureaucratic machine's going to grind to a halt just out of the inertia of trying to do that. This would give us a little bit more flexibility, right? Absolutely, yes. And um, Senator Manchin's version of permitting reform didn't include as much um, involvement with states, but the other West Virginia senator, Senator Capito, I think I pronounced that correctly. She also introduced a permitting reform bill called the START Act, um, which I prefer. I think it goes a little bit further and she includes um, some more reforms that include more state participation in this permitting reform because states know what they need better than the federal government does typically. Yeah, and part of this thing with the states when it comes to regulatory reform like this is the partnership between the states and the feds is somewhat broken right now. So mm -hmm. when you look, whether it's starting, that's not a perfect bill either, and neither is Ban Manchin's proposal. No, no. But this is a part of our government. We talk about Washington doesn't work and our state governments don't work. Well, one of the reasons Washington don't work and state governments don't work is they were designed to work together. And when they don't, neither functions properly. And that's part of this conversation, whether it's regulatory or something else, that gets glossed over way too quick, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think um, I think part of it is overreach on one side. It's hard to be a good partnership if one side of the partnership is trying to do everything, which I would argue is the federal government. I'm sure not everyone agrees with that, but um, especially in terms of federal dollars. So everyone's taxpayer dollars. The federal government um, has a lot of control over what states do when the federal government gives them money yeah and it comes down to the money quinn townsend joining us um congress of course when you're talking regulatory form you're not just talking process you're talking allocations of funding there's usually contracts involved in this is there a quick clean way to get through this there never is with congress but something like regulatory form which seems to have some momentum behind it because everybody's kind of especially after COVID, everybody kind of realized how much the regulatory state not only exists but how arbitrary some of it is because we can just turn it on and off on a whim when crisis comes right mm -hmm. is there a better way to discuss something like this so like like we opened with mansion brought this up he was doing it as a political wheel and deal and then people just kind of laughed it off because they personally either liked or didn't like what he did with the other bill and the policy got lost how do we highlight these policies because you know if you're for it or against it this seems like a much more important conversation than whether joe mansion got what he wanted in the political grand scheme of things right Absolutely. Yeah. My dream in my dream world, it would be that policies were important to people because they were um, because they were good or bad and they weren't good policies aren't attached to political maneuvers like like mansions was. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that's our reality right now. Um, so I'm not sure if there's I wish and hope that there's a there's a way to just talk about the policy and why it's permitting reform is important for the U.S., but um, it seems that good policy is always attached to politics. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, they aren't, though. Uh, Quinn Townsend joining us. When we look at this overall picture, whether it's the start, which is a Repu Republican proposal, Joe Manchin obviously proposed this. When we're looking at this, whether it's the Republican proposal or Joe Manchin's proposal, we have these big, dreamy, buzzwordy things clean mm -hmm. energy, energy reform, you know, the EV revolution, all this stuff. To get there, folks are going to want to use regulation. It seems to me prudent that we stop before we go to the dream world stuff and go, do we even know how to do basic regulation before you go to regulate your choice, you know, pick whatever you want, because everybody has their own things they want the government to regulate and give them because they want that power, right? We should have a little bit more uniform understanding of how, when, and why to regulate things before we go to that buzzwordy dream world, right? Like you were saying. 
Sure. I think um, I think that's part of what some of these permitting reform bills do is just roll back some of the unnecessary um, regulations or at least decrease the impact of the regulations um, that are that are holding innovators back in the U.S. Yeah, Quinn Townsend, uh, she's writing in real clear energy about this. Um, the mansion proposal is obviously dead. We opened with that because people were joking with it. The START Act is probably DOA because it's, you know, it got caught in the wash as well. But mm -hmm. we are going to have a new Congress coming in January. We don't know the shape of it. We know the Senate's probably still going to be close or tied. We know the House is probably going to go Republican. Is there going to be any movement for regulatory reform in this fashion uh, coming up, do you think? I certainly hope so. I think um, it seems to me that Republicans are making it more clear to the nation that they are interested in being a part of this overall environmental conversation rather than just saying the environment's fine, because that's traditionally that's kind of what um, the average person thinks that Republicans don't care about the environment and aren't interested in engaging in this climate change conversation. Um, and I think conservatives in general are making it more clear that they are interested in being a part of that conversation. Yeah, I think so, too. We keep covering it. We keep having new folks on. I think I think some of this is the language is starting to change. And I think it's a generational shift as well. Quinn Townsend mm -hmm. uh, back with us. Normally, our West Virginia correspondent for the Alaska policy folks, which is actually in Alaska today, uh, between your travels and until we get you back on again, let folks know where they can follow you, keep up with you and what you got going on, my friend. Sure. So I'm the policy manager at Alaska Policy Forum. So if you're interested in Alaska policy stuff, our website is a great place to see my work. Um, if you're interested in my energy and environment um, work, I'm on Twitter at Quinn Townsend numeral one. I think there's an underscore. I'm not super active on Twitter, but that's where you can find me online. Yep. And she's another one of our great young voices contributors. Always enjoy having her on. We'll keep having her on. Look forward to talking to you again when you get back to the lower 48 and a little bit warmer weather. Quinn Townsend, thank you so much for the time, my friend. Thanks for having me on. Yes, ma'am. Now let me see you go off like a bomb. Uh, and that'll do it for Herd Tell. Thank you so much for joining us. We would love to hear from you. We love feedback. We have done whole shows. We've done segments. We've done deep dives just based off what you all want to talk about. You have questions. You've had stories that you think aren't getting covered or not covered correctly. We'd love to hear from you uh, on the email, herdtellshow at gmail.com, Twitter at herdtellshow. You can DM us. Uh, you can follow us there. We'd always love to hear from you. Also, YouTube channel, uh, The Big Talker, our radio partner on their Facebook feed. You can leave comments. We can get a hold of you that way. Also, uh, wherever you're watching or listening, whether it's on the YouTube channel or if you're listening on any of the podcasting platforms, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, our podcasting numbers are getting higher and higher. Thank you so much for that. Uh, make sure you're following. Make sure you're subscribing. It's always free. And if they give you an option to leave a rating and a comment, please do so. It's really important. Let other people know and those platforms know that our little program is worth checking out. We're going to keep doing what we do. Turn down the noise of the news cycle, get to the things that matter, talk to knowledgeable guests, hash things out in an adult grown folk talk way. Cause it's loud out there. It's ugly out there. We need to be able to discern our times. And that starts with getting good information. That's what we'll keep trying to bring you right here on Herd Tell. So until we see you again, wherever you are across the street around the world, we hope you and yours are well. We hope you're well fed and we look forward to seeing you again for more Herd Tell. All the music on Herd Tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com.